Moderna setting up shop in China. That's as fears of a second COVID-19 wave in the country rise. The vaccine maker is saying it registered in China. So far, the country has only vaccinated its population with domestic vaccines. Stocks shot up at the news. This comes amid warnings from China's top health advisor that China could see 65 million infections per week come summer. What do you think about these developments? Let us know below and subscribe if you haven't already. This program is brought to you by Preserve Gold, the number one precious metals IRA provider. Call 855-962-3322. Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Moderna is setting up shop in China. The vaccine maker saying on Friday it's looking for opportunities in the world's second largest economy. That's as Pfizer and BioNTech cut their supplies in Europe. Stocks rallying behind the news, with Moderna's shares rising 2% in U.S. pre-market trading. The biotech firm registered as a legal entity in China this week. The company had no presence in mainland China before this. It opened an office in Hong Kong last year as part of an Asia expansion. Moderna has said that it was keen to sell its mRNA vaccine to China. But so far, Beijing has insisted on using only Chinese-made COVID-19 vaccines. This comes amid warnings of a second wave expected to peak this June. A top epidemiologist predicting over 60 million will catch the infection per week when the wave hits. Lead scientists at China's National Health Commission, Zhong Nanshan, warning infections could hit 40 million per week by the end of this May, adding the new wave is driven by the new XBB variant of Omicron. This has raised fears of more lockdowns. That's because Beijing implemented draconian lockdown measures after the CCP virus, which causes COVID-19, hit the country. The lockdowns sent China's economy reeling. Factories halted production, businesses closed doors, and residents were barred from leaving their homes. A serious warning from the United States about cyber attacks from China. U.S. critical infrastructure could be under digital siege from the communist regime. The State Department is targeting recent activity by a Chinese state-backed cyber group. Here's what a spokesman had to say. The U.S. intelligence community assesses that China almost certainly is capable of launching cyber attacks that could disrupt critical infrastructure services within the United States, including against oil and gas pipelines and rail systems. Uh, it's vital for government, uh, uh, network defenders, and the public to stay vigilant. Dubbed Volt Typhoon, the cyber group recently triggered a multi-nation alert. In a report on Wednesday, Microsoft said the group could disrupt critical communications infrastructure between the U.S. and Asia in the event of a crisis. Microsoft also says Volt Typhoon recently targeted telecommunications systems in the U.S. territory of Guam. It's home to major U.S. military bases and could play a critical role in the event of a conflict in the Indo-Pacific region. The National Security Agency said there was no doubt Volt Typhoon was putting itself in position to carry out disruptive attacks. Exactly what could these disruptive attacks target? The National Security Agency issued an alert notifying a broad range of critical infrastructure. That's including electrical utilities, nuclear power stations, water systems and railways. The Epoch Times contributor Kevin Stockland said over the past 10 years, China has managed to supply between 10 and 15 percent of the transformers for the U.S. electrical grid. If these devices were to break down, the grid would quickly stop functioning. But hospitals would no longer be able to run. Our, our communication system breaks down. A lot of our supply chains would no longer function. Um, and, you know, things like uh, water delivery and water purification, certainly heating um, and air conditioning, you know, all these systems would disappear overnight. Stockland added the U.S. Department of Energy may be looking to produce components for the electrical grid domestically. But right now, there are only a small number of American engineering firms that make them. Stockland is a business reporter for the Epoch Times and produced the Shadow State documentary. The first cabinet-level meeting between the U.S. and China in months held in Washington on Thursday. 
In it, commerce secretaries from both sides raised their concerns on trade issues. U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo voiced concerns about Beijing's actions on U.S. companies operating in China. Chinese authorities raided the offices of American firms Capvision and Mints. U.S. consulting giant Bain and Company also said Chinese police questioned staff in its Shanghai office. Plus, Beijing also said China's key infrastructure projects wouldn't use products from Micron, one of the largest memory chip makers in the U.S. China claims Micron's chips pose a national security risk. On the other hand, Chinese Minister Wang Wentao voiced his concerns, such as Washington's policy on restricting exporting semiconductor technology to China and its reviews of foreign investments. A statement after the meeting said the two had candid discussions and that both sides agreed to keep the lanes of communications open. Two agents of the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, are facing charges for a bribery scheme on American soil. The Justice Department said the agents tried to repress Falun Gong in the U.S. John Chen and Lin Feng were arrested earlier today in California. The DOJ said Chen and Feng tried to bribe a purported IRS agent with $5,000 in order to revoke the tax-exempt status of an organization run by some Falun Gong practitioners. They did so at the request of the CCP. But the IRS agent turned out to be an undercover law enforcement agent. Falun Gong, also known as Falun Dafa, is a spiritual practice based on the principles of truthfulness, compassion and forbearance. The CCP has been conducting a persecution campaign against the practice since 1999. Chen and Fang face multiple charges that could land them years in jail, including acting as an unregistered foreign agent and bribing a public official. The DOJ says they will continue to counter the CCP's efforts to intimidate or silence people in the U.S. In a rare display of bipartisanship, President Biden is backing House Republicans' HALT Fentanyl Act. The bill permanently designates fentanyl-like substances as among the world's most dangerous drugs. The measure already passed the House on Thursday. But some lawmakers tell NTD that more needs to be done to counter the fentanyl crisis. NTD's Melina Weiskup has the details from Capitol Hill. More than 150 people die every day from overdosing on fentanyl. The epidemic is described by the DEA as the deadliest drug threat our nation has ever encountered. And in an attempt to combat this today, the House passed a bill that would list fentanyl as a Schedule I narcotic. And Republicans say that there are more aspects to consider. It hasn't always been fentanyl, but what has been one of the common denominators in the problem is what's going on at our border and how the drugs get into this country. The whole, the whole drug problem is multifaceted and we need to address it. You got to deal with it at the source, which is our southern border. It's, that's how it's getting in. And so I would say even though this bill is important, the most serious bill is our border security package that we passed a couple of weeks ago. There were many Democrats who joined with Republicans to support this bill, although one of them told me that they would have liked to have seen some changes to it, but he described this issue as too serious to delay action on. This is not the way I would write the bill, but since I know it's a work in progress and something that's so devastating, Congress needs to take action. And President Biden does support this GOP-led bill, writing in a statement that the act includes critical components for the administration's plan to combat the supply of illicit fentanyl. The bill passed with 289 yes votes, while 132 Democrats and one Republican opposed it. Now, some are concerned about using criminal penalties to combat what they describe as a public health crisis. Mandatory minimums just don't work. Uh, you need to have... Uh circumstances differ from case to case. We know that China plays a role in trafficking this illegal fentanyl. Can you give our audience an understanding of to what level does China play in trafficking this fentanyl and is there a way you all can hold the regime accountable for this? Yeah, no, they play a big role. Well, I call it Xi Jinping's gang. To me, it almost seems like a criminal enterprise of what they're utilizing to try to get into the United States because they know of the havoc that it, it creates. The bill is now headed over to the Senate where it could be tweaked before final passage in both chambers and then off to the White House where the president is expected to sign it. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. More efforts from the U.S. to keep forced labor out of the border 
Witnesses testified Thursday in Congress before the Ways and Means Committee on America's Trade Policy. And one of the issues brought up was forced labor in the supply chain. NTD's Jason Perry has the story. Uyghurs held in forced labor in factories and internment camps in China. Garment workers held in forced labor in sweatshops in Bangladesh. And Michael Kanko, CEO of Import Genius, says he knows exactly how to help stop it. He explained how Import Genius has been able to help clean up supply chains. This gap is also impacting our ability to stop Chinese forced labor. Many of the goods sourced from China that appear on the U.S. government's list of goods produced by child labor or forced labor are typically shipped by air. He added that U.S. Customs and Border Protection only publishes shipping data for cargo shipped by sea, but not for cargo shipped by air or by land, which make up 43 percent of U.S. import value. And Michael Stumo, CEO of Coalition for a Prosperous America, pointed out another issue known as the de minimis loophole. It allows over 2 million packages per day to enter the U.S. without meaningful inspection. Chairman Jason Smith rightly said de minimis is essentially a free trade agreement with China. Allowing China to exploit de minimis is in fact unilateral disarmament of our customs and trade laws. And he talked about the overall impact it has with America's relationship with China. We're building their military and we're building their ability to invade Taiwan. And it's because we can't figure out that we need to build and make stuff here and employ our people and get our profits. During the hearing, Representative Earl Blumenauer advised the witnesses that there is currently a proposal that would take away the transparency of maritime shipping data, and if passed, that would practically end all transparency for shipping data to the public. Jason Perry, NTD News. When might Beijing invade Taiwan? Admiral John Aquilino oversees the United States Indo-Pacific Command. Here's what he had to say about it. What I can tell you is the secretary and the president have tasked me with two missions. The first is to prevent this conflict. And then the second one is if I fail at mission one, to be ready and prepared to fight and win. He added that no matter when it happens. The United States military is man trained, equipped, postured and ready uh, to execute both of those missions. Speaking at a panel on Tuesday, Aquilina also stressed the importance of communicating in order to avoid miscalculations. But so far, it's been hard to reach the Chinese side. So there is a, there is a technical connection via the defense telephone line that could be used. Now, that said, uh, if there were an event, I can tell you I would pick up the phone and dial it. Uh, I'm not sure anybody would answer it on the other side. Adding he's repeatedly asked to speak with his Chinese counterparts, something Beijing hasn't approved. The Pentagon says it's sending out an offer to talk, but the Chinese regime isn't biting. The update comes from Eli Ratner, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Indo-Pacific Security Affairs. He says the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, has rejected or failed to answer numerous requests for meetings with the U.S. That's including talks with Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, several regional commanders, and civilian Department of Defense employees. Ratner saying, quote, we've had a lot of difficulty, adding that, frankly, the ball is in their court at this point. The official also pointed out that keeping open lines of communication is critical to peace and stability. And beyond that, necessary to prevent a catastrophic miscommunication and possibly war over Taiwan. Ratner acknowledged the regime's aggressive military modernization efforts and said the U.S. was doing what it could to mitigate Beijing's threat. Over in the East and South China Seas, Beijing is doubling down on its territory claims. Vietnam accused a Chinese survey vessel and its escorts of violating its sovereignty and demanded that Beijing withdraw its ships from the country's exclusive economic zone. The ships have been lingering in the region for two days. China ignored the demand, saying its ships carry out, quote, lawful activities. The two nations have long confronted each other over a disputed area in the South China Sea, an economically strategic waterway which China claims as its own. The trade route carries more than $3 trillion worth of shipborne commerce annually. Meanwhile, China's Coast Guard said on Wednesday that its fleet entered the territorial waters surrounding the Senkaku Islands and conducted patrol within that area. The islands are currently controlled by Japan.
But Vietnam and Japan are only two of the nations that share similar conflicts with China. China recently released three navigation buoys to the disputed Spratly Islands, following a similar mark placement by the Philippines. That's all for today's China in Focus on YouTube. We're now sharing a shortened version of our program here after being demonetized for two years. Here's what to look out for in our second half. Concerns around data privacy have been making headlines recently. From companies' predatory data collection practices to fears over national security regarding China. Now, there's a new U.S. platform fielding those fears. We hear from Nick Janicki, Director of Media Relations at Genjing World, on what alternatives are out there. The idea here was to build a platform outside of uh, any CCP influence, absolutely, uh, and basically say, okay, we're going to build a platform that's for freedom, uh, it's for traditional values, it's for divine culture. You have to have some personal responsibility and know that when I go on here, I should have an intent, I should be looking at those things that will give positive reinforcement to my character, to the subject matter that I'm interested in, and the algorithm's actually then going to work in your favor. The full episode is available on our partner platform, Epoch TV. To sign up, click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. See you tomorrow.